Rise for the jury. I did hear that. Okay. So, the last call you had with Rebecca was approximately 5.30? Correct. And that was the call where you told her you were coming up? That is incorrect. When did you tell her you were coming? During that call, I said that I would be getting anything if she needed anything, uh, and she said she'd let me know which she knew I was on my way at that point. So what, at some point in the conversation, she had a change of heart from telling you, I don't know how many times through these pages of messages that she doesn't want you there that day. You're testifying that she had a change of heart during that phone call? Well, I cannot testify to her emotions. I don't, I wouldn't know that. What did she say to you? When I asked her if she needed anything, uh, like the radiator hoses or the bolts, if they were to break, she said, I'll let you know. But she had already told you not to come. So what did she say that would indicate that you should come? Well, to say that I will let you know would assume that she knew that I was in route, because otherwise would she expect me to bring them the next day when I'm at work? And she never did let you know anything that she would need from you that day, right? She never picked her phone back up after that call. Okay. And then from um, 6.36 to 8.05, you were on your drive up to Oshkosh? That would be correct. And during that drive, you attempted to reach her 31 times? Correct. Okay. So on average, you're calling about every three minutes and she's not answering? Correct. And if she already told you, I'll let you know if you need anything, there'd be no reason for you to just keep blasting her phone with calls from you, would there? Like I said, I didn't know if my phone was making connections or not. I don't get any voicemail prompt. And it comes up on my car, you just hit the button. So nowhere from Madison area all the way up to Fond du Lac, could you tell whether you had a phone connection? It's spotty reception, uh, so I don't, I don't know. So you just decided to continue dialing her number then, just to make sure she didn't need anything? Right, so that if, as I'm passing by auto stores, I can at least have a chance to stop and not turn around and have to go back. Okay. You were angry she wasn't answering her phone, weren't you? No, not at all. That's typical behavior of her. She was ignoring your repeated and insistent calls, and you couldn't control that, correct? That's false. She said that she left her vehicle in the Jeep. Okay. 
You've been drinking that day, correct? After I left the incident. You made a comment a few times while Mr. Seaman was questioning you that everything was happening that was happening at Rebecca's house was all very confusing to you. You made that statement, right? I believe so. Was it confusing because you were extremely intoxicated? That is not true. It was confusing to me because I was ambushed and attacked. Okay. And because, like you'd said before, Rebecca's never been violent with you in the past, right? Besides pointing guns at me, no. Okay. And you said that you and James Gruner had always gotten along well, right? Correct. Okay. So, 805 is the last call that you had attempted to Rebecca and she ignored, correct? Correct. And the 911 call came in at 827, correct? I believe so. I don't have it in front of me. So you drove from Fond du Lac all the way up to Oshkosh, shot three people in the head, and left in about 22 minutes? I don't know if that's necessarily an accurate time frame. If we could just go to a state's exhibit I'd like to publish that to the jury and just ask you a few questions about that. Now you uh, first testified that you confronted James somewhere there on the driveway. Correct. James uh, was by her Jeep. Oops. Uh, correct. James was by her Jeep when we met. Okay. And um, you indicate that he immediately began pushing you? There was one push um, by her Jeep, yes. Uh, would you have had an opportunity to just leave and walk back down the driveway? I would have, but I, I didn't understand what was going on. I was literally going to see the repairs be done. I don't know why anyone would have started being aggressive towards me. Uh, so at that point, I was just heading back towards where Becky was. So you're saying you just continued walking, and Mr. Grutner then, well, let me back up. So now you're walking backwards, and Mr. Grutner is just pushing you? This is correct. Now, at any point during that, would you have had the opportunity to just leave? I would have had to have fled through the side yard. But you could have left, right? What's that? You could have left, right? Um, I could have, but I... Okay, I'd... let me just um, ask you a couple more questions. So, at some point after James, you're claiming, is pushing you, he starts punching you. Is that what you're claiming? This is correct. Okay. Um, at any point while he's punching you, would you have an opportunity to just walk away and leave? Absolutely not. I was pinned in on all four sides. Pinned in by what? I had the mechanic and Becky on one peripheral side of me. I had the uh, toolbox on the other side with the car at the angle. And I had uh, Jim in front of me, the car behind me. But I thought you testified before that you didn't see the mechanic coming up from behind you until after shooting James. The mechanic coming up from behind me, you're confusing me. When I said that I stopped after he pushed me, I said that I had peripheral vision through the right hand side of my face of Becky and the mechanic in the garage. Is that when you're claiming you saw Rebecca with a gun? I saw Rebecca with a gun after I turned around. So when you're first claiming you were punched by James, you didn't see Rebecca with a gun? I saw Rebecca make eye contact with me and the mechanic make eye contact with me when I let out a plea for help to her, yes. Okay, but you didn't see those two with any sort of weapons at that point? At that point, I did not see a weapon in their possession. Okay. Now, you testified before that you were able to disarm Rebecca with this choking-style military move. Correct. You would agree that James, James Bernard is late 50s? on pain medication, which the doctor described as something like make you sleepy? I don't think that it actually makes you sleepy. It calms your nerves. Sure. Okay. Um, James Krugner was a late, in his late 50s. 
I believe so, yes. With Van Back? Sure. And you're a 20 year Marine? I am, and I've sustained 20 years worth of injuries. You're about six feet tall? Uh, five, ten inch. And you weren't able to do anything to defend yourself short of pointing a red laser at James and shooting him in the head? Miss Nash, the, the feelings that I was feeling at that point were that I was being ambushed and attacked, and literally three individuals dumped my head into a bucket of water, and I let out a breath of air, which was my plea to Rebecca for help, and no one came. They dumped your head in a bucket of water? I, I'm trying to explain the emotions that I felt at that time in Smash. I never claimed that they physically did it. Okay, but you're just saying that they made eye contact and weren't doing anything. They were not stopping. They were not stopping James from assaulting me. No. But again, you're a 20-year Marine, and he's a man in his late 50s with a bad back. There was probably some sort of defensive intervention you could have attempted at that point. I don't believe so, Ms. Nash. They, they were clearly making an attempt at my life. At that point, just James, though, because like you said, you didn't know anything. Yes. Okay. So you felt that this gentleman in his late 50s, not a very big guy, was making an attempt at your life. You didn't take any action apart from just pulling out your gun? And asking Rebecca in a plea for help to stop her stepfather from attacking me. Okay, and you have significant firearms training, correct? I have firearms training, yes, I don't know what you call significant. You've been in the Marines for 20 years, right? That is correct, but that doesn't mean that justifies significant training. How long have you been using pistols? Since 2011. Okay. Fair to say that uh, a laser affixed to a 380 Ruger is going to make it more accurate? Not at all. Fair to say that if you point a laser at someone's head, that's where you're intending to shoot them? That is not. A laser has to be calibrated and adjusted to the point of aim as the barrel sees it. I never adjusted that laser. It could be pointing anywhere, and so I did point, not. Wait a minute. So are you trying to say that when you pointed a laser at his head, you were really meaning to shoot him in the leg or the foot? I wasn't, I wasn't pointing it anywhere intentional in this match. I literally brought it up and pulled the trigger. Where it was is where it was. I didn't even see the laser come on. The laser comes on as you squeeze, um, okay, as you squeeze the pistol so, grip. Just so I understand, he's facing you with his fist cocked back is what you testified to? I did not testify that he was facing me. I said that the first hit had shifted me to the right, and that put me off of his shoulder at some degree of an angle. And he was cocked back, and when the trigger went off, he was in forward motion of swimming to hit me again. But you'd agree that the bullet hit him in the side of the head above the ear, right, and travel at a downward trajectory? That is correct. <coughs> so was he swinging at you but not facing you? Is that how that came to be? When he was cocking back, uh, he turned his body in a swinging motion to come in to put more effort behind the punches, but my guess would be, I, I can't speak for... And so, were you afraid because of the close proximity he was to you? That and that there were two other individuals who were not responding to my assistance at all, and that my back was turned towards them. And you'd agree that the doctor, uh, chief medical examiner, had testified that there was absolutely no evidence of close-range firing in this situation, correct? I agree that he stated that, but I do not believe his statement to be accurate. And his testimony was that no close-range firing would mean that the gun was fired from at least five feet away, or you'd expect to see some sort of evidence? That's what he stated. So. So you shoot James, and um, let's move on to... State's Exhibit 48, if we could just publish that and go through it. So just so I understand, 
you're claiming that as James packed his fist back, he swung his entire body back such that you were able to fire the, in the side of his head and it would travel at a downward trajectory toward the back. So he's really swinging. No, I've never said pulling back like that. You're making exaggerated motions that did not, did not indicate a smash. Just why don't you just show me how, how he turned that? All I'm saying is he came like this in a motion of putting force behind the punch. When you when you want to apply a punch to someone with all your effort. Well, I guess my question goes more toward you shot him in the side of the head and you know the bullet traveled at a downward trajectory towards the back. So you're saying he's standing in front of you about to punch you. I never said he was standing in front of you in the snatch. So you shot him from the side then? What I said was when he hit me, I rotated to the right so I was at some degree off of the shoulder when he was coming forward to hit me again, rotating to hit me again. I can't state how that angle is. But it would be fair to assume that he wasn't looking at you then when you shot him, if he was shot at that angle in the side of his head, right? When he was cocking back, he may have lost visual with me. I don't know if he lost visual with me or not, but I can't testify for him. Okay, so yeah, you can't because you killed him. Um, so he goes down in the driveway right there, and at what point do you see Rebecca with a gun? When I spun around, uh, and then am facing the garage. So now you see Rebecca with a gun in the garage? That's when the mechanic came at me when I spun around. As I'm starting to rotate left, I see her with the gun pointed at me. And so the mechanic comes at you with some sort of object? That is correct. And you had stated previously in jail calls when you were trying to explain this to your friends that it was a wrench? I did state that because I didn't know what it was at the point. That only seemed, I saw the glint of it. I don't know if it was a wrench for certain. It could have been something in a slashing motion. It could have been something in a blunt force trauma motion. So, can you describe again this claim that you had that John is making this tomahawk motion? Is, is he four feet from you at the point? At that point? I would say within three to four feet of me, uh, traveling in a forward motion. And again, we all saw John. He's a very small man, right? Okay. I, I don't know by definition what you call a small man. The size of John when he saw him. Did he appear to be a small man to you? I only got a glimpse of him, Miss Nash. This happened very, very quickly. They were attacking me. Well, you saw him in the courtroom when he testified, right? This, this is correct. Okay. And you'd agree that he's a small man? Correct. And I guess I have to ask you again that you're a nearly six feet tall, 20 year old Marine, and John is in his late 50s, a very small and stature man. You made no attempt to disarm him if you believed he had a weapon, is that correct? He made no attempt to not attack me either, man. Well, you indicated you didn't even know what he had in his hand. I said it was an object that could induce one force trauma or slash, I don't know. Well, how are you making that determination? You didn't know if it was a wrench or a knife that could slash? I saw the glint of a mismatch. He was in an attacking motion towards me. My presumption is that he was going to attack me from behind, but I had turned around. He was already in his attacking mode. You, you made no attempt to disarm him, though, correct? I didn't have time. Okay. Didn't make an attempt to use that military move that you were able to easily disarm Rebecca with that you were talking about before? That would have required me to stop, place my weapon on the ground, stand back up, and already be knocked unconscious. So, knocked unconscious? If I stop and place something on the ground while someone's attacking me, Miss Nash, there's potential that they're going to succeed in their attack. So you were in fear of the small man that we saw in here today with an object that you couldn't even identify while he was four feet away from you? You couldn't turn around and run? Turn, turn around and run where, Miss Nash? It's an open area, anywhere. This all happened. You didn't do any of those things, right? 
I could have attempted to turn around and got shot in the back. Is that your opinion? Well, if you thought Rebecca was going to shoot you with a gun, you would have been able to turn around and shoot her in the back. Well, she because he was already in a forward motion of travel towards me. And where was John standing on that map when he supposedly did this? Right in this area. And where were you? Right in this area of this And so you were shooting into the garage then, essentially? No, I was still at an angle facing to the right. So if I'm looking at that picture, John would have been on the right and you on the left? Correct. So. The angle that I would be facing is that way. So a bullet would have fired into the wall of the garage, you believe, <coughs> shooting at that angle? I don't know that it would necessarily fired into the wall of the garage or the impact through bone structure through the jaw would have caused it to fall off the other side. I can't. I'm not a ballistics expert. And then your claim is that John, after being shot in the face by you, ran toward you and through the grass, just ran right in front of you? Correct, ran in between me and the garage. This is true. He was already in forward motion. And so he'd be running in forward motion in front of you, right? Correct. In a pattern that way. And that's the direction he was coming at you from? Correct. So it would seem that it wouldn't be possible for John to have been shot in the right side of his face then. If he's forward motion in front of you, coming at you, it wouldn't be possible for you to shoot him in the right side of the face because his left side of the face would be exposed to you. Ms. Nash, he was shot before he took off running that way. He was shot. You just said he was coming at you and already in forward motion. He was shot right here when he was in forward motion with a tomahawking motion. But again, if you are standing closer down the driveway, John is behind you, running towards you, wouldn't it be his left cheek that would be exposed to you? No, Miss Nash, she was swinging with his right arm, swinging this way at me, which exposes his right cheek to me. Once he was shot, he then went this way. I don't see how that's possible on that map, but I guess we, we can move on. So he runs then right in front of you with his left cheek passing you? That would be correct. Okay. So what do you see next? At that point, I twist left and I see Rebecca has a gun pointed at me. Now at that point, you indicated that Rebecca she hadn't done anything to you in this attack. So fair to say that at that point, Rebecca would have been defending herself, even if everything you say is true? Objection, Absolutely. Your Honor. That calls for a legal conclusion. Overruled. Well, let's just think of speculation. And it's fair to say that she would have to say that. So now Rebecca, you're claiming, is now pointing a gun at you, and she's just been armed with a gun and watched you shoot her father and her friend, and she's just standing there? Miss Nash, she was attempting to kill me. Well, and she didn't do it sooner when she saw you just kill two other people? I don't know what her reasoning behind it was. I don't, I can't speak for her. I, I have no idea why I didn't take a bullet to the back of the head, honestly. Okay, right. Okay. So, now you're claiming Rebecca is pointing a gun at you, so you have to shoot her as well, right? That is correct. And you have this laser on your gun, and you decide to point it at her forehead? Miss Nash, I didn't know where I was pointing it. The gun was literally up eye level. So with all three of these people, is it just a coincidence that you shot each of them in the head? You didn't intend to do that at all? I have no intentions to place headshots, that is correct. So, moving on from there, you heard testimony from neighbor Ryan Garad Johnson, and she testified that she looked out and saw you just standing there and the two of you locked eyes. Is that right? 
I did hear that testimony, yes. Do you remember seeing her? I did not see her at all. And I guess, going back to Ryan's testimony, the bedroom that she was talking about is in the southwest corner of her house, so basically as close as you can get to where you were here. And is your testimony that James just began pushing you and punching you and not really making any noises while he's doing that? Correct. He was not yelling. He was not making any noises. The only conversation or verbal command he made was uh, Becky that I could understand. So is that how, after hearing Ms. Gira Johnson's testimony, you're able to explain that she wouldn't have heard any sort of disturbance because it was a silent fight that James was trying to engage in with you? You know, Ms. Nash, that has been my statement from the beginning that I hand wrote and pre presented to my attorney on this That statement, though, is after you denied it to Green County deputies, denied it to Oshkosh police officers, and came up with a bunch of different stories, right? I didn't deny anything. I kept asking them what I was being arrested for, and they were not telling me. I told them that I did not murder anyone, and that is a true story. You were watching while that video was playing of you saying you have no idea what, why they're there, right? What's that? You were watching the video that we all saw with the Green County deputies? Correct. So, you testified that you have police experience within the military? That is correct, Ms. Ash. So you know that if you're the victim of an attack, you can call 911, right? That is correct. And that's pretty common knowledge if you're the victim of an attack, right? That is common knowledge. And you didn't do that here, right? No, I did not, because I had just gone through a traumatic event, and I was confused. I had no clue why. My main concern was Safety but for myself. you agree that the three people you shot in the head had also gone through a traumatic event and probably needed assistance, right? Miss Nash, they tried you, to kill you, me. One of them fled the scene. I do not know if he went back in the house to get a gun or not. Well, he fled after you shot him in the face, right? This is correct. So, this is a residential area. Most streets around there are, are look kind of similar. Lots of houses packed together. Did you ever stop at any house and try to get assistance? I did not, Miss Nash. And you got in your vehicle and you fled the scene, right? I did not flee the scene. I headed back towards safety. At that point, my mind was confused. I had no idea what had just been thrown upon me. And my main concern was getting was towards it, safety. Was it confused because you were intoxicated. Negative, Miss Nash, I was not intoxicated. So, you indicate that you were concerned about John leaving the scene after you shot him in the face, and so that's why you got in your car and left. Is that your testimony? Also, I did not know if there were any other people remaining in the house, um, and I, I didn't know if I was going to be attacked by someone else, Miss Nash. I had no clue that I was walking into an ambush that night. And after you left the scene, fair to say that once you're in your car and driving away, John, who you saw leave on foot, wasn't going to pop out five miles down the road, right? It's fair to say, but there's also vehicles there that he or someone else could have got in and chased me down. I don't know. I don't know what their intentions were that night, Miss Nash. So you're telling me that you didn't call police because you believed it was possible that John, who you just shot through the face, jumped in a vehicle to track you down. I said it's a possibility. If they wanted me dead that bad, that is a possibility of what they could have done. Well, if you were so in fear of your safety from them, why didn't you call 911 to have an officer meet you on the road wherever you were? It didn't even come into my mind, Miss Nash. I literally was scared and confused. I, it didn't even come into my mind. It, I literally just had gone through an extremely traumatic event. My mind was not on call 911. It, it just didn't sure. even So you me. did at some point decide to make a call, though, and that wasn't until 
906 p.m., right? I believe so, Ms. Nash. Would you say I'm sorry? I said I believe so. And you explained your intoxication that we all viewed on the Green County video as as being based on you stopping in Fond du Lac to did you get gas, got beer, wash your face? Is that correct? Correct, Ms. Nash, that and the endorphins and adrenaline and the added traumatic event that I would just said went through caused me to be shaky, unstable. Sure. So uh, did you sit there and calm down for a while? In the squad car, um, I tried to... No, in, in where you say you stopped for gas in Fond du Lac. No, I did not stop and try to calm down. So what did you do at the gas station in Fond du Lac? Um, I put gas in to proceed home. Okay. And what else did you do there? I washed my face off in the bathroom because I was crying, and I bought a six-pack of beer. While you were in there after this traumatic incident, I assume there was a clerk that you purchased the beer from? That is correct. And did you make this clerk aware that you've been a victim of all this? No, I did not. And instead, after doing all those things, you just got in your car and continued your flight home? That is correct, Ms. Nash. Okay. Um, I'd like to show you what's been marked as State's State Exhibit 91. Would you agree that that was the first call you made, that 906 call to Lee Hildendorf? Correct, ma'am. And that call pinged in Wakan? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you're trying to explain how you made it from, or excuse me, you're trying to explain your drunkenness on the scene in Green County by saying you stopped in Fond du Lac, got gas, bought beer, washed your face, right? and the combination of going through a traumatic event and the release of the adrenaline and endorphins and the safety at that point of it's over, no one's chasing me, no one's attacking, the police are here. It's, okay. It literally makes you weak at the knees if you've ever gone through a traumatic event like that, Ms. Nash. So, 827, the 911 call comes in and you made it all the way to Wapan by 906? with stopping in Fond du Lac to buy beer or get gas? If that's, if we will find itself in Fond du Lac, yes. Do you happen to know the distance between those cities, between Oshkosh and Wuhan? I do not. Now, you've said that at that point, the endorphins went down, you felt like you could make a call, is that what you're saying? No, I, I was still shaking, I was still crying, I was still in fear, and I just instantly reached out to Lee, he's one of my best friends. Uh, like I said, Lee was a um, distress, veterans distress call guy um, for years, and I, I used to talk to Lee every single day, and it was just... How old is Lee? 76 years old this, this year, Ms. Nash. Is he kind of like a father figure to you? He's a really close friend of mine. Um, I wouldn't say he's a father figure. Um, Lee worked with me and taught me how to become an engineer, and for that, I'm grateful and I talk to him constantly. Okay, so... You, as far as you're aware, in Oshkosh, you left three victims with gunshot wounds to their head because you're claiming you were so scared. And the first call you make isn't until 9.06, and that's not to 911, right? That is correct, Ms. Nash. It's to this old friend of yours, right? That is correct, Ms. Nash. And isn't it true? So as you 
continue to proceed toward your home, you received a call from First Sergeant Cargo. I did. And you acted like you had no idea what he was talking about, about this incident you were wanted for, right? That is correct. And when you finally arrived in your driveway, Green County deputies made contact with you, correct? That is correct, Ms. Nash. Now, as we saw you step out of your vehicle, would you agree that you were really drunk? I would not say really drunk. I would say whatever five and a half beers does to a person along with going through a traumatic event, Ms. Nash, that is what was reflected in that video. But you were kind of unsteady on your feet when they asked you to get down on your knees. It looked like you almost fell over. That is because they also had me walking through my yard. Okay. And those officers had an EMT that was there to look at you, right? That is correct, Ms. Nash. And the EMT asked you several times whether there were any injuries to you? That is correct. And at no point did you disclose any injuries? I did not. I literally was at a loss. Um, sure. And at no point did you disclose that you'd been the victim of this attack? Negative, Ms. Nash. And you made contact with several deputies from Green County that night, any of which you could have made a report to if this were true, correct? It is true, and I also attended Naval Law and was told not to make any statements without an attorney present. Therefore, I did not make any statements and chose to execute my Miranda rights to not but, make a statement. But you did make several statements. You made several statements that you didn't know what they were there for. Um, and then when you made contact with Detective Hargis and he asked you about the incident, you claimed it didn't happen, you weren't involved in it? I didn't claim that I wasn't involved in it. I claimed to him that I did not murder anyone, and I was not going into further details with him because I was not willing to give a statement that night because I did not have legal representation. Sure. So you didn't make any sort of report to any of these deputies, and then uh, with Mr. Argus, you didn't make any report to him? Negative, Ms. Nash. And you saw the photographs that were taken, that they were taken that night of the incident, right? The photographs? Of the, I'm sorry, of you. That is correct. And you agree that there are no visible injuries to you in those photographs? Those photographs did not depict any uh, visual injuries. However, I did report to jail staff by noon on August 5th that I could, if I could get pictures retaken because I had bruising on my side, which you cannot see in those photos, and my left eye. Was it after you decided to make the self-defense claim that you were indicating there were bruises that wouldn't have been visible to the officers? That is false, Ms. Nash. mad at Rebecca about the Tahoe the night that she decided to fix it when you told her no, right? No, I wasn't pretty mad, Miss, Miss Nash. I just wanted to, as we say in the Marine Corps, inspect what you expect. I expected that it would be fixed to the point that it could be driven back down to my house. So with an expectation, you have to inspect that expectation to sure that it is. Sure. So Rebecca was an adult. You felt like they that you needed to stand over her and control how she was doing this job, right? Absolutely not. She was not doing the job the other mechanic was. She was and helping him with it. She testified to that, right? Sure. Okay. And you were going to stand over her and watch her do it because you told her <coughs> not, right? Negative. I went up there to assist to make sure that when I retook possession of that property that I wouldn't have any future issues with it. It wouldn't break down on the way to my house and we have to figure out how to then get it and incur another bill. That was my only intentions, Ms. Nash. All right, well, um, fair to say that about a week after you shot Rebecca in the head, you were upset that she still hadn't delivered the Tahoe and your stuff to you? I was not upset at all. Okay. Just like to play a portion of uh, what's labeled 
7M, this is jail calls for Lee Hogendorf, 8 12 2020. <coughs> and this will be 608 to 649. Go ahead. Could you drive behind the barn and see if those trucks and tires are there? Uh, yeah, yeah, there was a part to see those land there. Okay, that means she hasn't been out there yet. Okay. Is somebody supposed to take those or you need those locked up? No, she's supposed to deliver all my shit and take those, which means she hasn't delivered any of my stuff. Okay. Good, then I, I should still be getting the Tahoe back. So you're talking to Lee and you'd agree that you sound upset that she still hadn't delivered your shit and you wanted your travel back, right? There was no upsetness in my uh, tone of voice in that call at all, Ms. Nash. And when you made that call, you were aware that you had shot Rebecca in the head about a week earlier, right? I was aware that I was involved in a self-defense incident, yes. Where you shot her in the head? That is where she was shot, yes. And isn't it true that you've asked Lee Hildendorf to make up a story about Rebecca to bolster your new self-defense claim here? That is false. Okay, I'd like to play um, uh, 7N. It's jail call to Hildendorf, September 10th. I'm sorry, this will be 1208 to 1220. Yeah. No, I agree, but um, like I said with that, according to what I mean, you're going to have to make that story sound good like you saw the whole thing. Now, when you're telling someone to make a story sound good like they saw the whole thing, you're telling them to lie for you, aren't you? That is not true, Ms. Nash. Lee has a tendency. I would write him a six-page letter of everything that I need to be accomplished in the last days, and he would write back two sentences. I, so I needed a detail in it. Sure. So your story that you wanted to make up about Rebecca, you want a detail in it. There is, there is no making up of the story, Ms. Nash. Well, you do say there, um, like I said, Fair to say you're instructing him in letters on what he's supposed to, this, this story about Rebecca, he's supposed to make sound good. Is that one of the really long letters you had to send him? That's absolutely false. With every letter I sent Lee, there's a jail phone call associated with it, describing what is in those letters. After that call on September 10th, did you follow up with Lee about this story he was to make sound good? I did not. Did you or you, through your attorney, send private investigators to talk to Lee about this story about Rebecca? Objection. Relevance. Goes to the ongoing coordination with the defendant and this individual to fabricate a story about Rebecca. Ooh. So did you talk to Lee Hilgendorf after that about making this report to your private investigators? I did not. I'd like to just make for you a jail call. Um, this would be at, uh, 7P, October 7th, jail call 1. And I'll be playing 453 to 525. Yeah. 
Right, in regards to the individuals that my attorney Seaman sent to ask him specific questions as part of the, the investigation for this case, I did not want to destroy anything that we were using for our defense by putting it on the jail's recorded line that Detective Artis was listening to. Is that because Detective Artis then could determine that it wasn't true? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation, relevance. I'll withdraw the question. Um, so moving on to 7Q, uh, October 7th, jail call 2, 845 to 942. These investigators are two women. Oh, really? Well, either that or there's one woman and one very feminine guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was on the phone and they didn't actually come to yeah. your house. Yeah, yeah I'll, get a, I'll get a copy of it at some point. So, yeah, you don't have to say anything about what was in there, what was not. Well, I wasn't. I realized I shouldn't have. Would so, you guys lay down or real quick? Yeah, they, I don't know when I'll get a copy of it. I think they have to read it all out or something. I have no idea. I don't know how this works. Well, she read it all back to me, and I made a couple of corrections that she didn't quite have right. And So those conversations, were those about the story Lee was supposed to make up about Rebecca that was to sound good? That is not. That was uh, Mr. Siemens' uh, investigators asking about different things associated with this case. Okay. As your time in jail went on, did you attempt to explain away, explain the situation as self-defense to one of your friends, Aaron Spice? I uh, attempted to tell him certain things knowing that one of the detectives would be listening, knowing that the corrections officers had stated that there was no weapon found at the scene. I still didn't have representation yet, and I wanted to get portions of the story out there. Um, and I made two calls, one on 819 and one on 91. Uh, well, I'd just like to play for you a little portion of the call from September 1st. This is uh, 7S, 1415 
And the detective was like, what do you mean? And he was like, he just went down the way. Oh, no. That <laughs> doesn't sound so good. No, it doesn't sound good. No. So, no. Now that final portion there, mm -hmm. you kind of laugh about the fact that you initially told Lee that the mechanic got away, right? You're laughing there about that? That was my tone of voice, Ms. Nash, yes. And you're indicating that doesn't sound good for your self-defense claim, right? That I said that because I used military police context in saying that on the phone to Lee, in that suspect got away on foot, fled north through side yard. That doesn't sound good, no. So as you're, as you're laughing there, saying it doesn't sound good that you had told Lee he got away, what you meant was you were really using police terminology when you talked to Lee about it? I was saying that, yes, when I talked to Lee about it, that the context that I put it in would be how it was described by an officer when the mechanic fled the scene, yes. And you'd agree, though, that you know, common use of he got away means he's getting away from you, right? No, Ms. Nash, I would not agree with that. And you also indicated something different than what you're testifying to today in that you're saying that the mechanic ran away before the Rebecca pulled the gun, and that's how you're trying to explain that the mechanic testified that there was no gun. No, that is not true. I, I understand what you said in the audio, and when I turned left, there was a gun pointed at me. Yes, I was not releasing full details on that phone call for specific reasons because that is not my testimony. Yeah, but you'd agree that on that call, you say Rebecca didn't even pull a gun out until the mechanic, you shot the mechanic in the face and he fled, and then Rebecca pulls the gun out. And now today you're saying Rebecca had the gun out before you shot the mechanic? She did have the gun out. When the mechanic came across me, the gun was out. Okay, yes. But that's different than what you tried to explain to your friend there, right? I was just stating, I wasn't stating facts, Ms. Nash, nor was I giving away case details on that call. Okay. Now, you indicated that when you left the scene, Rebecca was laying in the garage. Was she motionless at the time? She was motionless. And the gun that you're claiming she had was just tossed under a table at that point? When she went to the ground, it had fallen out of her hand and was forward of her body, yes. Okay. And visible to the naked eye, though, just sitting at, uh, under the table there? I saw it, yes, when I was there. Mr. Seaman had asked you a question about how, in hindsight, you viewed something Rebecca did as a trap. He asked me, in hindsight, yes. I don't uh, remember his exact words, Ms. Nash. Okay. Is it fair to say that the changes to your story are because, in hindsight, you're trying to cover up the fact that you drove there to shoot three people in the head? That is absolutely false. There has been no changes in my story since when I handed them as a testimony on August 20th to my attorney. No further questions. You're great. Thank you. Josh, are you right-handed or left-handed? I'm left-handed. And so it was it with your left hand then that you had to fire your weapon that night? Yes. And so when John Miller was coming at you 
swinging down with the shiny metal appearing, appearing object. What hand did he have that in? He had that in his right hand. And what hand was your gun in? My left hand. And that was the hand that you fired at John Miller with that, correct? Correct. As well as uh, the other two, correct? That is correct. I'm going to object to the leading nature of the question. Same. Now, when was the very first time you saw the gun in Rebecca's hand? To Mike again. When was the very first time you saw the gun in Rebecca's hand? So, I saw it when I turned around, when I turned around from um, Jim to the garage, but at that point it wasn't aimed directly at me. I saw a glint of it. Um, but the mechanic was already um, trying to attack me. I had to go with immediate threat to my life, which is somewhat in motion of trying to kill me. And how much time had elapsed, could you estimate, from the time John Miller came at you with the tool or whatever it was, or knife in his hand, until he had passed in front of you after being shot and you saw Becky. I mean, you're talking seconds. It, it, it was quick. And you weren't injured, aside from the punches that you received from Jim, were you? Uh, like I had said, all the blood vessels in the left uh, side of my eye um, were ruptured um, at noon on the 5th. I asked the jail staff to take new photos of me and they denied my request. But otherwise, you didn't, did you punch anybody or anything with your hands? I did not. Now, how is it that you know this uh, Balthazar that you had mess messaged with? Um, me and him served together in uh, um, I believe it was Afghanistan. And how long have you known him? Eleven years. And we were asked about this message that you sent him on the fourth that uh, Rebecca was pissing you off. Do you recall that? I do. What were you referring to, or why was it that you had sent that message? Because she was putting my stuff uh, by the road, personal belongings. And when did you learn that? Uh, on the 4th. And do you have exhibit number 89 in front of you? I do. Now, from that exhibit, how many times did Rebecca call you on August 4th? Is this... Does this mean outgoing is from me or her? Well, Exhibit 89, are you aware if that's a yes. extraction from your phone? Okay. So, are you aware of how many incoming calls that you received from Rebecca on August 4th alone? Yes, they're all listed here. And have you seen them on site yet? They're listed here. Do you know how many incoming? Can you tell from the exhibit yourself? Yep. I'm counting. Looks like three. And I'm going to focus you on line 53, page 6. Okay. The 
Is that the first call that shows it is incoming from Rebecca? It is. What time was that one? Uh, 1500 hours. And how long was that phone call? 17 minutes and 8 seconds. Do you recall that particular call? Um, that particular call would have been the one where she was telling me they were going to be working on it. Um, and that would have been talking about the uh, her asking me to call Lee about if any modifications were done to the vehicle uh, to get the right radiator and stuff, I believe. And that one was for how long? Uh, 17 minutes and 8 seconds. And I'm going to direct you to line 50. Can you identify what's indicated on line 50? A call from Becky. And what time did that call come in? 16.53. And for how long did you two talk during that call? 8 minutes and 21 seconds. Do you recall what that conversation was about? Um, that was more talk about uh, the radiator and her putting my stuff by the road. And did Becky call you again on August 4th? Um, she did. And what time did she call you next? 1729. And for how long was that call? 15 minutes and 53 seconds. Now, you had testified at one point that you had felt that, or you had told Lee that you had fucked up. Do you recall that? I do. And when asked to explain why you had fucked up, you felt that you had been lured into a trap or something to that effect. Is that correct? That is correct. Did any of these phone calls that you received from Becky on August 4th lead you to that? I believe she was using my personal property and the Tahoe repairs to draw me into her house, yes. And did you receive a text message from her as well? I did with her address. What, if any, part did that play into it, or how did you take that? I took that as they're starting to work on the vehicle. That's where it's at. Now, do you have Exhibit 24 in front of you yet? I do. States Exhibit 24. Ooh. And I'm going to direct you to page 10. Okay. And on the left hand side, do you see messages from you? I do. Can you move closer to your mic? Yes, sir. On the left hand side, do you see messages from you? I do. And what's on the right hand side? Messages from Rebecca. And can you go down to the, looks like, fourth message from you beginning with the word Saturday? Do you see that? Yes. And do you recall sending that message? I do. And could you read that? Maybe we could talk about a path forward or how to fix things. Saturday afternoon, you're dropping off all my crap. Uh, got it. That's one step in a direction of closure for you. And did she respond at all, Rebecca? She did. She said we should be there by 10 a.m. Now, do you recall what date it was, or does it indicate on there what day this was? Um, Monday, uh, that would be the third. And so, up to, so on August 3rd, to your knowledge, what was the intention with your property and the vehicle? That it would all be returned on the 8th. And when did you first become aware then that they were going to be working on this vehicle on the 4th? On the 4th. Do you recall what time? I don't have a specific time off the top of my head. Do you recall how you learned that? Through what medium? Um, I believe um, Becky called me. 
Now, I know it'd be one of the telephone calls that you had just indicated on Exhibit 89. Correct. Now, you had testified uh, regarding all these text messages and Facebook messages that have been presented here that you were wanting to retain, repair some type of relationship with Rebecca. Correct. What type of relationship was it that you were trying to maintain with her? Uh, if anything, just a friendship. Uh, we have developed over the years. Um, I didn't, I didn't necessarily understand why she was throwing everything away like that, which I had repeated in multiple texts. Were you Facebook friends with her? I was. Now, since the breakup in March of 2020 up until August 4th, can you estimate is it even possible how many times you had been called by Rebecca? I don't think there's any until the 729 time frame. So you didn't, to your knowledge, you didn't have any phone calls from Rebecca? I would have to look through the logs, but no, during, during the March to whatever time frame, there was just spotty texts back and forth, nothing, no phone conversations, no nothing. I left her alone. And you were shown some text messages between you and Rebecca uh, back in 2018, or that referred to that 2018 uh, allegation. Do you recall that? I do. Did you see, based on your relationship and knowledge of her, any point in responding mm -hmm. or engaging in any type of text message? No. I I learned that it's not even worth responding to all of those things that she puts in text, allegations she puts in text, because all she does is pin it back onto me, and I'm not argumentative. Um, there was there is no reason to argue. You testified at one point in response to. Attorney Nash's question uh, about your mental state during the attack, with, you felt like your head was dumped in water? Correct. Can you explain what you were trying to convey there? Sure. Um, so to show the emotion that I was feeling, it would be if you were just sitting there and three people just smashed your head into a bucket of water and your last um, breath of air, you have a choice whether it's water, which means death, or air, which means surviving, and I think anybody's first instinct is to go into flail and kick for air versus water. What was your instinct? That was my instinct, too, was survival. No further questions. Thank you. Cross? <coughs> um, just briefly, you just indicated that you... You just didn't respond to a lot of Rebecca's allegations from your strangulation of her in 2018, right? A lot of allegations, period. Okay. But you did respond when you promised not to put your hands on her again, right? I did respond. Okay. And you did re respond when you apologized to her that you're losing control, right? I did. And you indicated that what Rebecca was calling you about this repair. I assume you're trying to imply that she wanted your advice about what, what might, excuse me, what might have been modified. Is that what you're testifying to? I'm not saying she wanted my advice about anything. Um, I was trying to explain to her that that vehicle had been belonged to Lee, and I'm not sure that a standard radiator would fit it. A modified radiator is required. I have no idea. And you did make those comments to her in your Facebook exchange when you were trying to tell her why she can't go ahead with this repair, right? 
I was saying that we need to find out first, and the call log will show that I was also in contact with Lee throughout some of those calls. And her response is that, Josh, I looked at the radiator, it's like five hoses to unhook, right? That is what she said. However, I was trying to tell her that Lee may have modified that engine, uh, and I'm not sure if that was also equipped with a oil cooler. And after she continues to tell you that she's going to do this, and you call John and tell him not to come to her house, she tells you, we are never getting back together, you have issues? She does. And all of these messages took place shortly before the shooting, correct? The day of. And you indicated that there were very few exchanges for, between the two of you in the five months after she broke up with you until leading up to this shooting incident, right? Correct. But then in the days before the shooting, you see her Facebook change to single, you see her communicating with other men, and you continue texting her, asking her to repair the relationship, correct? That is true, but none of that had any effect on what happened that night. I did not do this out of any sort of jealousy. They literally Well, it would be fair to assume that after Rebecca had broken up with you five months ago, you weren't even communicating that much in mm -hmm. the interim, that she wanted to get all your things out of her house and finally be done with the relationship completely, right? I would assume that that would be correct. And you just couldn't let her do that, correct? No, that's false. And your property and the Tahoe being at her house was something that was still connecting her to you, correct? That's false. That all that had to be done was returned. There was no bond holding anyone to anything over the property. Well, that's what Rebecca planned to do, though, right, is return it that following weekend. And she made plans to do that, right? She had stated that. I don't know what her real plans were. No further question. Oh, excuse me, one more question. Have you ever been convicted of any crimes? I have, yes, one, an OWI. No further questions. Anything? No, sir. Can we shut down? Thank you, Your Honor. Call the next witness. Lee Hildegard. person talks at a time because she's taking everything down. Okay. Mr. Stephen. Thank you. Can you please state your name, spell the first and last for the record? First name is Lee, L-E-E, -E. last name Hilgendorf, H-I-L-G-E-N-D-O-R-F. And how old are you, Mr. Hilgendorf? 76. And are you retired? Yes. yes. Good for you. Where are you retired from? Um, I was a mechanical design engineer. And how many years were you employed in that capacity? Uh, just 50. Now, do you know Joshua A? Yes, I do. And how do you know Josh? 
Uh, we worked at a company together for quite a few years and became friends. Do you know approximately how many years you've known him? I would say about 14. Sorry. Now, do you know who Rebecca Barkowski is? Yes, I do. And how do you know her? I met her through Josh. And are you aware of the relationship between her and Josh? Yes, yes I am. Now, at some point, did you sell to Josh a Tahoe? Yes. Do you recall when that was? I would say about four years ago. 2017 time frame? Yeah, it could be, yeah. Uh... Why did you sell that to Josh? Uh, I didn't need it anymore. I needed a pickup truck. I bought a truck. And are you aware of all of what Josh did with it? I'm, I'm sorry, what? Are you aware of what Josh did with that Tahoe? Um, he had it at the farm for a while, and uh, then he loaned it to Rebecca. Now, did you become aware at some point that the relationship between Josh and Rebecca had ended? Yes. And did you have any role at all in attempting to retrieve any of Josh's property? Yes. And what was that? Um, arrangements had been made to get all of Josh's stuff back. Um, a couple of his friends uh, worked with me. I rented a U-Haul, and uh, we came up here. The, I got the young guys to load the truck for me and load the uh, Tahoe on the trailer and bring it back down. Now, I, I want to take you back, back though, to uh, before August, after they broke up sometime in the spring of 2020, or the summer of 2020. Okay. Before August 4th, had you made any attempts to help retrieve Josh's property from Rebecca's residence in Oshkosh? Uh, Josh and I had made plans several times to go up, come up here and get everything and it was always canceled at the last minute. Do you know who canceled the plans? Rebecca. Now I'm going to draw your attention to August 4th, 2020. Do you recall that day? Is, is that the day that Yes, sir, the, the day of the, the, the shooting. Okay. Yes, I recall it. Now, did you have contact with Josh on August 4th? Yes, I did. Do you recall the first time it was that you had contact with him? Uh, I had gone to bed and he called me. So it was after 9 o'clock. And did you answer the phone? Yes. And what, if anything, do you recall that Josh had said to you? Um, his first comment to me was, I killed him all, and I thought he was giving me a bad time because it was late, he knew I went to bed early. And I guess I kind of laughed at him, and he said basically what had happened, and he said they kept attacking me. They kept attacking me. Why did they attack me? And I kept talking to him, got dressed, found out where he was at, um, where he was going, said he was headed back to his place. I jumped in my truck and headed out from my place to his place. And you repeated that Josh said he kept attacking me. He repeated that for over an hour as I'm driving over to his place. He was, he was asking it as a question. Why would they do that? Can you describe it all if you could tell from over the phone what Josh's mental state was? Um, he was so confused. He 
works in Madison, so twice a day he's driving from his home to Madison and back. Uh, he got lost in Madison and ended up heading north instead of heading down towards his place. And what you described uh, regarding Josh repeating how they just kept attacking him, would that be fair to say that that was the general yeah, nature of the conversation? The nature of the questions. The same. So, do you recall for how long you talked with Josh? Uh, it takes about an hour and 10 minutes to get to his place, so I talked that long. When I got to his place, the sheriff's department had the whole place surrounded. And why did you go to Josh's place? That's where I was telling him to go. And did Josh at some point arrive? Yes, he did. Now, I'm going to jump ahead to on or about September 10th after Joshua was taken what was in the Winnebago County Jail. Okay. Okay. Did you recall receiving a phone call from Josh on or about that time frame? We talked almost daily. Do you recall a phone call from Josh where he talked to you about an incident of Rebecca pointing a weapon at him? Um. We talked about a point where she pointed a weapon at me. And you talked about this in the, uh, from the Your Honor, I'm going to object. This is an other acts statement that hasn't been allowed by the court. Judge, may I respond? Go ahead. They've opened the door twice now. They've gone down this road, once with detective artists and once crossing and uh, questioning Joshua about this alleged phone call. And the phone call, your client said, that would point you to gun at him, meaning Joshua, not this individual. So, the uh, objection is sustained. No further questions, thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, so, on August 4th, earlier in the day, Joshua called you mad that Rebecca had a man that was coming over to I guess we're called the radiator, as he put it. He called me. I don't know where I want to put that. Um, he and I were set to go get all of the equipment in the Tahoe on Saturday. Did that plan to go and get the Tahoe come after Joshua told you he didn't want someone fixing the radiator at Rebecca's house? That's correct. Okay. So um, was he upset that this that Rebecca suggested this man fix the radiator? I'm not that familiar with what all transpired there. Did Joshua believe that this man was her boy Rebecca's new boyfriend? He never said anything about it. Do you recall um, talking to Detective Jeremy Wilson about this incident? Talking to who? Jeremy Wilson. I, I'm sorry, sorry, I can't, can't hear you. Jer Detective Jeremy Wilson? Yes. Okay. I'm going to just play a recording of your call with Jeremy Wilson. Uh, this is Wilson Call with Lee Hogendorf, 7R. And I'll be playing it at 58 seconds to 1 minute 21 seconds. I wasn't shooting. Apparently, there was an urgent boyfriend uh, working on the tunnel. Okay. And uh, Josh said he wounded him. Oh, okay. Does he remember who all he shot? Um, just those three. Okay. Mentioned to me. So you indicated there her new boyfriend was working on the Tahoe. I think that was an assumption on my part. Okay. And 
So when you talked to him at 9.06 p.m., he sounded confused and he was lost in Madison? Correct. Right. Okay. And you'd been talking to him on the phone about what he claimed happened that entire way? We really didn't discuss what happened as far as what he did. Um, My talking to him was I just wanted to make sure that he didn't do anything to himself or that he didn't take off. Sure. I wanted him. I'm from, I'm from a police family, so I know how this works, and I knew darn well that the police were listening, either listening to our phone calls or they had already pinged his cell phone and knew exactly where he was at, which turned out to be true since. Once I got to his farm, um, they had me park my truck uh, by the house so that when he came down the street, he would see it sitting there. And they put me in a police car and took me down the roadways. Okay, so these conversations that you had had um, with Joshua, that was prior to arriving at his residence? Somebody yes, Sorry, she's taking oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We talked pretty much the whole time. Okay. And you testified for Attorney Seaman that Joshua had said that several times they attacked him. That's what you testified, right? He kept repeating that almost the whole time. It was, it was a, in the form of a question. Okay. And did you uh, make contact with the Green County deputies when you first arrived? Uh, I'm sorry, what was that? Did you make contact with Green County deputies when you arrived at Joshua's house? Yes. And that would have been when your conversations with Joshua were freshest in your mind, most recent? I was still talking to Josh when I pulled up to his place. Okay. And a sergeant walked over, and I kind of indicated to him that I had Josh on the phone, and I went like this, don't say anything, because I, yeah. I was hoping he wouldn't realize the place was surrounded. Okay, so very recent to your conversations with him, you made contact with a Green County deputy. Yes. Just like to play body cam, um, sorry, uh, 7T, this is labeled Enable 2, 102 to 136. Has he told you much? Just what he did. Okay. All right. Did well, he say apparently it? she and her father verbally attacked him. Okay. Maybe even physically, I don't know. Okay. He's a 21-year Marine Corps first sergeant. Okay. And he's been in a little too many tours, okay? Okay. Um, I've never heard him this confused, and I've known Josh. Okay. Like 10 years. Okay. He's so confused he lost and got lost in Madison. So, what you told Green County deputies immediately after those conversations was that Joshua had said he was attacked verbally by Rebecca and her father, and you didn't know if there was any physical altercation, right? I guess so. It was a little confusing that night. Sure, and let me just move on. Um, did you subsequently talk to Oshkosh Police Department officers and tell them that Joshua, that you couldn't tell, I'm sorry, let me back up. You met with Oshkosh Police Department detectives, right? Yes. And you reported to them that you couldn't count the number of times the defendant said, I fucked up, right? <laughs> yes. And you also indicated to officers that Joshua realized he messed up, right? Yes. Did the defendant also try to tell you that he had blacked out? No, I don't think he used those words. 
Did you tell the detectives that it sounded like he blacked out? I might have because there was, when, when, while Josh was talking about it, it was like he didn't know the sequence of the events other than the fact that he had shot them. Um, he thought at least two of them were dead. And you also talked to detectives about the issue with the return of the Tahoe and something setting the defendant off, right? About returning the Tahoe and what? And something setting the defendant off? Uh, I'm not getting the last half of your sentence. Sure. Let me just play a portion. Uh, this is from Wilson interview with Hilgendorf. Seven, you? I guess I'd object to just playing a video without having a question or a reason why. Overruled. But you knew that. So then yesterday I was kind of guessing in the afternoon, because I talked to him in the morning. He and I both worked in home. Okay. Um, so we get away with yakking out the phone while we're working. Um, he said, he called me in the afternoon, I don't know what time it was, and said, uh, she's got some guy over there and he's ripping the radiator off. Um, and I said, you know, don't worry about it. Just let it go with Josh, just we'll go Saturday and pick it up and we'll make sure that all the air is out of the system, take our time driving him back. And the next thing I know, I got a phone call from him, um, really confused. Okay. Where was he when he called? Was he in Madison at that point, or was no, he... No, he was, I think he was more along the lines of Beaverdale. Okay. Okay, and so he was confused? Very. Uh, what was he telling you? Well, of course, every few seconds it was, I really fucked up. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure I believed him, but he said he shot him. Okay. That is stopping at 6.01. So, you're saying there that you were telling Joshua, let it go, Josh, right? Yes. That would imply that there's something he's upset about when you were talking to him? I think he was more upset just like I was that I think my hearing aids are messing with this. I'm sorry. Oh, I think Josh was more upset like I was upset because we had been trying to go up there and get the stuff and she kept canceling and kept canceling and kept canceling. And this whole deal about the radiator, um, she asked for an exorbitant amount of money to pay for the radio, or radiator. So you also said there, you said you didn't know what set him off. Was that he was upset about this? Well, I think he was upset, like you just said, because it kept getting dragged out and dragged out, and then all of a sudden she's asking for $500. So fair to say something set him off and he couldn't let it go was what you were reporting there? I would say he just got fed up and tired of putting this thing off. And when you talked to detectives, did you report to them that Joshua had told you that the mechanic got away? Yes, I will. Yeah, he did. Okay. And has the defendant asked you to lie about Rebecca in order to bolster his self-defense claim in this case? No, because he knows I wouldn't do that. Did he at one point say to you, like I said, with that pointing the weapon at me, you're going to have to make that story sound good, like you saw the whole thing? That's possible. Okay. And... If he's telling you to make a story sound good and like you sound, saw the whole thing, wouldn't that imply that he's asking you to lie about something? 
No, if you knew the whole story behind that well, incident. I'll, I'll just ask you the questions. You, um, hold on a minute. When the defendant starts that statement, he starts it with, um, like I said, and then he goes into this story that you're supposed to make sound good. Had the two of you been corresponding by letters pretty frequently? No, all contact has been cut off between Josh and I. But do you, had you prior to that been communicating with him by letter? Uh, yes, because I'm taking two care of two of his properties. And are you paid for doing that, or do you just do it because of yeah, I'm just trying to help them out. Okay. And you're helping him out, not getting paid for the work that you're doing. Is that because of this close relationship that the two of you have? Yes. No further questions. You correct? No, you're right. You're going to shut down. Defense can call the next witness. No further witness because you have the defense rest. Any rebuttal witnesses? No, Your Honor. I would just move into evidence states exhibits. Seven P, Q, R, and S. Any objection? No, you're not. Except to receive the exhibits. Ladies and gentlemen, we are done with the testimony portion of the trial. We'll send you upstairs, and I have to give you some paperwork with the attorney so it can take a little bit. Uh, then we'll bring you back down here, and I'll give you some jury instructions, and both attorneys will make their closing statements, and we'll send you for your deliberations. Close your books, ladies and gentlemen, and you find the chair. Rise for the jury. I need some time to talk to Josh before we do jury instructions. So I can't hear you. I need some time to talk to Josh before we do jury instructions. Verdict. Any objection 
check and see if there are any of the errors? No, Your Honor. No, and uh, my only correction previously was the middle initial of John's name, but I, I believe that's been fixed. Uh, if I didn't, I will. J, correct? It is J. All right. And then jury instructions will throw out the non self defense one, and we'll use the self defense one. And start with 100. Go to 115. Let me just find it. I forgot it. I just cut. I copied and pasted from the information. And the information did not have Mr. A's name in there. So, so the case, and then I just added his name. Really made sense. We'll continue on with 110. I think in number two, we don't need another human being, just put James Cooper. I just didn't know from the facts if there's an allegation that he was shooting at someone else and in air hit Mr. Cooper. There's no transferred intent issue. So I, that's why I'll take that highlighted section off. Then continue on with in the middle, take out to the standard closing paragraph and put in 805, which is the self-defense. We continue, once again, on counts two and three, I add in the name of Joshua Davis, the defendant. Add in 1070, which is attempted the first three attempts on the side. And then once again, I think we need to add in the self-defense on those. And adding in those conclusionary paragraphs, the last two paragraphs, for the changes done. Or we should find them with yourself first. And continue with 140. 145, information not evidence. 103, evidence defined. 170, circumstantial evidence. 195, pure knowledge. 157, remarks of counsel. 160, closing arguments. 155 exhibits, 148 objection of counsel evidence received over objection, we have that, 147 improper question, have that, I don't think anyone has to be a strike anything, so I didn't, so take out 150, agree to that? Yes sir. <coughs> 172, circumstantial evidence, right, escape, concealment. 175, motive. 270. What do you want me to put in there? Testimony has been received regarding the character of the defendant for Any just general character evidence? No, I mean, that's kind of like, I think this refers to reputation, opinion, habit, stuff like that, doesn't it? So, 270 take out? Yes. yes. 
That's for me to read, all about that. 275. I'm required to give it if asked. So if you want me to do it, I will. What conduct do you want me to put in there? And which of the ones do you want me to say that it's in regard to? Do you want that to remain, Scott? I'm just We have no problem letting 275 go. The movie that you said? Yes, that's what he said. Yes, sir. It's just that Mike is up. See, he's younger than I am. He doesn't wear hearing aids. <laughs> yes. All right, we'll take out 275 then. The state has no objection to that? I have no objection. Stop at that point, and you will do closing arguments. And then I will finish with 460, 484, and 515. Any changes, modifications, additions, deletions need to be noted on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. From the defense side. Thank you. Reading my mind. All right, I will make copies. I will give you new copies of the jury instructions. That will take me about 10 minutes. And then we'll bring the jury up. 
about if we just plan three o'clock? Sounds good. Perfect. Three o'clock to be back and start with the instructions and we'll get our